So one of the things that human societies have to figure out, uh, especially urban areas or, or large cities uh, that have developed throughout the course of human history, is to answer the question, where do we get our water from? And uh, the city where I live, uh, Tampa, Florida, is no different than many others. And uh, several years ago, I started working with um, a variety of interdisciplinary colleagues, uh, geographers and hydro uh, ecological modelers and biologists to uh, take a look at this question for the Tampa Bay area. And it has a really interesting, very political uh, history uh, in this area. You think of Florida as being you know, it's subtropical, there's water everywhere, it rains all the time, you know, the Everglades is uh, filled with water. But in reality, Florida has a very distinct dry and wet season, uh, just like many places in the tropics. And uh, during the dry season, water scarcity is, is a huge issue. So uh, from decisions about watering restrictions for uh, taking care of those wonderful green uh, plasticky lawns that we like to put in our subdivisions to uh, just the basics of you know, having enough water to uh, flow down major rivers and then out into the bay, replenishing fresh water into the saltwater bay. These are all issues which became very, very contentious uh, in Tampa Bay over the last couple of decades. And uh, one of the decisions that was made was to uh, pump large quantities of water out of the Floridan Aquifer and use that for drinking water. And essentially what happened was uh, there were uh, permits that were granted to um, cities who were growing and you know, developing that uh, suburban sprawl that characterizes much in Florida. And uh, so water was taken from what we might think of as the hinterlands of this uh, growing urban and suburban sprawling uh, megalopolis that is Tampa Bay. And um, so it was moved from the hinterlands into uh, these growing areas. And for a while, everything was fine until all of a sudden entire lakes started disappearing. And, uh, you know, we have a really severe problem with sinkholes that seems to be getting worse and worse. There was just an event a couple nights ago on the news here where two houses were swallowed up by a sinkhole. Uh, last year, there was a man who, uh, who died in, he was laying in his bed and there was a sinkhole that opened up underneath his bed and the earth swallowed him. Uh, these kinds of stories only happen in Florida, uh, probably not, but uh, this decision about where we get our water from and what the social and ecological consequences are is pretty significant here. Uh, it really kind of uh, hits you in a, a visceral way. So uh, we were interested in, in the politics of decision-making around uh, where we get our water and alternatives that have been proposed. Uh, we're also uh, documenting the, uh, the knowledge that people had about local changes in water resources like wetlands and rivers and lakes that they uh, encounter. And um, more recently, we're uh, doing a research project that focuses on the impacts of climate change uh, and specifically on water infrastructure in the Tampa Bay area. So uh, we've developed a series of possible climate futures based on climate science uh, state-of-the-art climate science it has been locally downscaled, as well as uh, local perceptions and concerns, places of iconic interest in Tampa, uh, and we've created a, a video-based scenarios that uh, we are sharing with lawmakers and uh, residents and other key stakeholders to get their feedback about uh, possible climate futures for Tampa Bay. So I carried out my ethnographic fieldwork on a little Pacific island called the Republic of Nauru. And Nauru is uh, located in the mid-Pacific. It's about 50 kilometers south of the equator, and it's a single coral atoll of around 21 square kilometers in area. There are about 10,000 Nauruans living on the island, um, but because, um, because of the, the geography of the island, which I'll talk a bit about in a minute, um, the population density is quite high because only about four square kilometers of the island is inhabitable. Now the reason for this is from the early 20th century, from about 1905, um, 
Nauru and Nauruans have experienced a great deal of economic, social, political and demographic health changes. And a lot of these changes can be attributed in no small part to the um, discovery of high-grade mineral phosphate on the island, which um, which was subsequently mined over the following 90 to 100 years. First by colonial authorities and then when Nauru gained independence in 1968, by um, Nauruans themselves. And the proceeds from this mining um, in no small part were invested for Nauruans' future and at the same time some of the profits were paid to Nauruan landowners as royalty payments. Now most of the resource that is phosphate has since been mined out and um, the mines have largely been exhausted. We know how set up a good infrastructure for the delivery of health care for uh, traditional issues of uh, emergency medicine and uh, addressing infectious diseases. Um, but for problems that we're facing as urbanization happen in an increasingly globalized world, there's a huge gap uh, between institutional approaches that are stuck in one spot. For example, this clinic that I uh, in Columbia and these health issues that are really located in the community. And that's, a, I think, a great area for anthropologists to address as we uh, work in community. And we have to rethink how we try to deliver health care uh, in new ways. And I think here we can draw on models that already exist. Uh, um, farmers, you know, base workers, or some of what's been done with, uh, by Byron Good with trauma and disaster areas and with local experts. Um, but I also think there are opportunities for medical anthropologists um, and anthropologists and activism and community-based approaches to think about what would healthcare look like if it were democratized, if it were, uh, in a sense, put into people's hands and that you had people going out and facilitating these sorts of things rather than having people come to you. And one thing that I'm interested in um, now is to look at, for example, how can we use uh, exercise uh, community-based settings um, in ways that work rather like uh, pharmaceutical drugs that are being used much, much too much for uh, many psychiatric or behavioral health disorders, and we know that um, human contact plus uh, exercise uh, is first low cost, um, but often heightens the impact of community-based or cognitive intervention. So I think that sort of model of you know, what are some areas we can focus on that match up well with anthropology and that will offer added benefits to existing models as well as meet the community where they are in terms of the local resources, the local involved and things that we put in there. Those are the issues that uh, I think are truly important and that need this middle space between a very individualist perspective often coming from microeconomics and the institutional approach which is often taken by you know, sociology or developmental studies or government-based approaches. And that's where most people live their lives. And so having both applied work as well as uh, theoretical work in that space, both intellectually and in an activist or community-based approach, I think is uh, where anthology needs to, to be. It's cool. And a station that um, actually has a, sits in a really unique position in that we are um, have good working relationships um, and are well-respected by both um, some Several government agencies, including the Department of Health, um, what's now called Public Health England, which is a new agency, but then also sort of non-traditional health um, government agencies. So we work particularly on topics around, say, fuel poverty and cold homes. We work very closely with the Department of Energy and Climate Change, which is the government department that's in charge of tackling fuel poverty. So we are fortunate in that we sort of have... Um, a leg in the door with government agencies and we're sort of um, sit in several sort of reference groups and um, 
advisory committees and things like that um, that involve the uh, nonprofit NGO sector. Um, so that's one way in which we can influence sort of top level policy discussions. Um, and a lot of the funding at the national level comes out of those discussions. Um, but then on the opposite side, um, we work with academics who are developing, doing the research around specific research, and we take a lot of that and we trans essentially do um, translation research, evidence translation to um, then provide sort of resources and I hate the word, but we call them toolkits um, to um, local communities in the UK um, because public health is now, well, in England, so public health is now um, the responsibility of local authorities within England. And so we are working very closely um, through a number of avenues to provide information that we hope is easily accessible and easily understood from a non-public health perspective, and that includes thing, that includes providing and working with um, city planners, transport planners, um, health and health and safety, health protection people, um, but also local educational institutions. Um, I'm really keen to make sure that we acknowledge the impact um, that local religious organizations have on issues around things like fuel poverty um, and helping people tackle um, some of those issues. So I'm fortunate in that I work in an organization and that over time has developed um, has developed good working relationships sort of across the, the policy and infrastructure um, system. Um, and so at times it can be very complicated and confusing because we're kind of going in both directions, but in many ways it's very interesting to be able to sort of both listen and participate in the top level um, discussions, but then and also try and implement um, and help those who, are, those who are implementing and working on the front lines locally. Average commute time from the respondents to my survey to get to this school was over two hours. And some of, the, some of my participants were traveling three hours one way from their homes to the school. And that, of course, is because of what I said. There, there really aren't options that are, there aren't options for them where they live. Many of the um, many of my participants live in Mexico City, which, if you've ever been there, is choked with traffic. But then they also live, you know, geographically quite a distance from this school. So as you can imagine, the family structure is put under a lot of pressure when they have to travel six hours or more um, daily just to get to school. That doesn't include the time that the kids are in school. So oftentimes, the mother is usually the one accompanying their small child on public transportation to get to the school and they often can't work so they stay in and around the school waiting for their child who's in school you know five or six hours and then they commute home together that means they're eating sleeping doing their homework um, all kinds of things on public transportation just to get to that school so it's it's disruptive for the family unit it's disruptive in many ways for their um, for their home communities um, and the community, um, the deaf community surrounding the school is also limited in the way that it can operate as a, as a community because of this movement. I'm here now to talk a little bit about the infrastructure that, um, or the impact of infrastructure on township residents and or people in Cape Town, South Africa. So, um, what we see here is a very, very interesting, um, historical, um, story of these um, people. So essentially during apartheid, um, the government decided to take all the colored and black residents of South Africa and place them into these townships in order to keep them out of the white areas of South Africa. As a result, um, a lot of these families went from being farmers themselves, having their own food, being sustainable, self-sustainable, to now having to rely on working in townships, um, doing some sort of um, Western economical type of job, for example, um, working in an office, right? Those jobs are very limited. Um, and it's only as of recent that they, or since post-apartheid, that they would actually hire a black or colored person in order, or hire a black or colored person to work in um, an office type setting. Um, rules had to be established, specific ones. Um, otherwise, the infrastructure or the um, 
environment was severely different from where these people originally came from. As I mentioned a minute ago, um, most of these people had their own um, farms. Um, they went from having their own farms to literally um, no land at all available. A lot of um, the Kosa <clears throat> people, um, I'm having difficulty pronouncing that stuff, the Kosa people though, um, essentially were herders. Um, and now that they've were moved into these townships relatively recently, about 20 years ago, a lot of them have lost that livelihood. Um, in essence, they have to really rely on small economic ventures because a lot of the times these townships are placed so far away that the people can't really commute every day or can't afford to commute every day to get a job in downtown Cape Town, right? And again, um, only because of apartheid do we see the integration of um, actual black and colored residents into the um, workforce. Um, I believe there were some rules where the colored people were colored, right, which is different from black. Um, colored people were allowed to work and, you know, establish a livelihood through working with the white people in Cape Town regions, right? So infrastructure-wise, there has been a big impact um, on these societies, and this in turn impacted food insecurity. Um, this impacted their health, and this is what we're seeing now. We're seeing that outcomes of these social processes and, um, yeah, social, you know, processes, political um, decisions. A couple of interesting things about um, the road paving project in Southern Belize currently underway. Um, this road is thought um, to bring other infrastructure developments, for example, electricity that people desire. Um, so that they can work into the evening, students can do homework um, that are attending high school. So the desire for electricity fuels the desire or the, the welcoming of the road. Um, the desire for um, entrance into, uh, well, ease of entering the market economy, not to, uh, members are already part of the market economy in many ways, um, even though they primarily subsistence farmers, there's a, there's not a clear delineation um, between taking part in the subsistence economy and the market economy, but both are accessed um, by almost all members of the village at the same time. But this increased access and this increased ease um, in taking part in the market economy um, is also something that goes along with um, the coming of the road. Um, in addition, um, it's important to note that the road was funded by um, governments um, from far afield, uh, many of them from the Middle East. And shortly after the road project started, um, it came to pass um, that the government of Belize was um, talking with um, an oil um, extraction company who's looking to extract um, petroleum from one of the national parks in southern Belize um, and on the land um, traditionally held by the Maya villages in that area. Um, the petroleum company um, was from Guatemala. The representatives came from Guatemala. And the fact that this road existed that was being funded by um, Middle Eastern dollars and um, was eventually going to connect in um, through the Guatemalan border um, in the next phase of the project was um, part of this discourse surrounding why the road was there. Was it really to help those villages or was it to provide access for these companies that were wishing to extract the natural resources? So um, connectedness also means um, vulnerability in this sense. Um, one example of an extreme case um, was something that happened actually when I was in um, Crooked Tree uh, in 2008 conducting my dissertation research um, where the lagoon flooded and covered the only roadway into the village and um, people had to take boats to get in and out of the village for approximately two months. Um, and although the school is located within the middle of the village, uh, for the first time since the 1970s, there was also flooding within the village. And it cut off the village into three separate 
pieces. This meant that children could, who were walking from certain parts of the village could not walk their normal routes to the school um, because the roadways were flooded. Um, there were people who were taking dories or a, a canoe to get to different parts. And this was a big concern uh, in the village, understandably, um, for young children uh, walking to school. Um, they were worried about the health of the children as well as the safety of the children. And they actually closed school down for a couple of weeks. Um, this was, for me, a little bit of a shock of, as an anthropologist who was there to study school, but certainly I was flexible and understood the, um, the disaster within the community and was particularly interested in how people res responded to this. And um, in fact, several um, individuals involved in the village council, as well as um, different kinds of community leaders and elders got together and built a bridge that um, enabled children to um, more easily get to school. And uh, many parents started walking their children to school as well. Um, a, an organization from the states donated um, rubber boots that children uh, war to get to school every day. And then many community members opened their yards to these children so that they could walk through their yards to access the school. Um, and this whole um, system was um, you know, very well supported by the community um, and children were walking sometimes an hour and a half to get to school. In my community is our southern police um, in between Punta Gorda on the coast and the Guatemalan border to the west are currently undergoing a massive infrastructure development. Once a dirt and rock road mm -hmm. is now being paved. This development has been on the cards from um, anecdotal conversations that I've had mm -hmm. for over 20 years and it is currently underway. This road promises to connect these Maya villages um, to the rest of Belize and to Guatemala in a way that um, is prepared to have economic benefits, also benefits for school children um, who have a quicker ride to and from high school. It will be um, so the increased traffic will provide revenue for restaurants and shops along the road in the villages. And from what many people say, um, bring these villages um, electricity and um, connect them to the global present. When I talked to members of Santa Cruz Village about what they thought about the paving of the road, um, the first thing they said was that, well, there was nothing that they could do about it, that it was happening. Even though they had pre been presented with an environmental impact assessment and there were many concerns in the village about um, the impacts, environmental, economic, social, um, of the road, they felt that the government had mandated the paving of the road and there was nothing they could do about it. Um, the second, um, Face of idea about this infrastructure development, the painting of the road, was I think best expressed by Apollonio Pop when he told me, Well, Christina, it's a little bit good and it's a little bit bad. So the benefits of having a paved road, of being connected both to Guatemala and um, Punta Gorda Town, um, were seen as, as positive, um, shorter travel times from marketing. Um, for students. There was a lot, lot of also um, concerns about the negatives of this development. Um, what if people coming from Guatemala were um, able to steal from folks in the village? What if the trucks passing um, made the roads unsafe for children walking to school or to the corn mill? Or for um, the pigs and chickens that roam the village? What if they were killed? Who would um, pay for the economic value of those animals. Um, how about the hunting dogs? As of um, in about a month that I spent in Santa Cruz last year, um, there were a total of 10 hunting dogs that had been killed um, in about a month's span. 
also, um, these are very real concerns that people in the world have about the, the, the road and what the road will bring. The road will bring connection to the global economy, to the market economy. Um, people driving along the road will be more likely to stop and have a meal or buy from the shop or to visit the archaeological ruin that's in um, the village. But they'll also bring um, people that the villagers feel are undesirable, people that might want to steal, steal land, um, steal livestock, um, and they bring danger. So, um, as with most infrastructure developments, there is a little bit good and a little bit bad. And folks are negotiating these ideas about what they think, but with a sense of, of not being able to control um, the development of this, um, of this road 